But uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker, John Gersma. He is our CEO of Harris Polls and Harris uh, Research and Analytics, and also another best-selling novelist. And we talked about uh, microtrends, and, and for all of those of you who have done a persona exercise uh, recently, it looks like we have to redo those uh, <laughs> with some of the demographic ships out there. And, uh, and John is going to talk about some of the big trends around companies and brands doing good and changing the world and how that can affect your reputation. So without more ado, John, welcome. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, we're going to talk about corporate reputation. CSR, branding, marketing, and how we're seeing these all sort of coming together and mashing up in a really exciting new way. We're going to talk about this in the context of what we call big ideals. Um, and the focus around big ideals is this belief that in this time of divisiveness in our society, when there's dysfunction and gridlock in government, and there's a lot of concern around you know, politics and, and how do companies get involved and should they get involved, what we're starting to see in our data is this emergence of a bunch of companies that are actually flourishing by becoming, quote unquote, public servants. They're stepping into the void of leadership uh, that's sort of been lost over time as a result of, of a lot of this dysfunction that we see emerging. Um, so we talk about it in this context of big ideals. And what I'm going to do is, is look through and kind of give you a few examples of some of the the people that we've met along our journey to kind of frame what we're talking about. So let's start first with um, Jamira Burley. So Jamira's um, had an incredible upbringing, um, an incredible life. She started uh, becoming an advocate, and her road to becoming an advocate and to being the White House uh, champion of change started tragically in Philadelphia when her um, brother was killed. She's had 12 of 13 of her brothers have been incarcerated over time. And she decided to become an advocate against gun violence in Philadelphia. In that process, 7,000 miles away in Lahore, Pakistan, is Samir Khan. And Samir had a weapon to fight discrimination and violence against women and girls, and that was a video camera. She went in to document uh, the, the experiences of these child brides, and she would then go in and sit with tribal elders and try to really talk about reversing these incredibly terrible policies that have sort of, you know, captivated and imprisoned women and girls um, all throughout Pakistan. Both of these women I had a chance to meet, and they're absolutely incredible. And they didn't know each other. They were 7,000 miles apart. They were fighting these sort of cultural ingrained headwinds that have been driven by indifference, by all sorts of interaction. And somebody came to the rescue, and it was a skin care cream. It was a skincare cream from this guy. This is Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever. And I met Paul in 2008 when I wrote a book on the rise of mindful consumption. And he, at the time, was really sort of the lone voice really talking about this project, right? What is the role of a modern day corporation? How should companies get involved to impact the social good? Now, it's one thing to be a small boutique firm to talk your values. It's another thing to be a really complex, big, heavy, multinational corporation taking on everything from gender inequality to sustainability through your supply chain. And what I found fascinating about what he set up was this program called a USLP. And we were hired to create one, a Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. For each Unilever brand, there is a corollary social positioning. And that means that each one of these brands has to have projects that go out that are, impact the social good. So you've probably heard about the Dove Real Beauty Project. You might have heard of the Vaseline Healing Project, which is a project they go into refugee camps using Vaseline products to really focus on trying to help and, and alleviate skin care disease. And with us, we're working um, through this incredible program to take these women change makers, these 50 amazing women all over the world that are doing NGOs in education, they're doing edu NGOs in imprisonment. Uh, Saskia Nino de Vera, she's got a really interesting project in the Mexican prison system, working on reducing the rate of recidivism of, of women prisoners that are mothers that have kids inside these prison systems that basically are creating this systemic cycle that it continues to repeat itself. 
all over the world to do incredible things. They're investing billions of dollars to do this, and our charge is just working on one sliver of a project for one brand, which is to take these amazing women change makers and drive through a program with Vital Voices leadership to impact the impact of these entrepreneurs and help them support the work that they're doing around the world. What I think is really interesting about Unilever in that example is that they're stepping out onto this stage in a whole bunch of different ways. So at Harris, you know, as Mark talked about our research through the Harris poll, we have focused on really trying to tackle issues in society. And one of the things we just did at Davos last year was a piece of research on unconscious bias in impacting gender inequality in the workplace and in the media. And in this, we interviewed actually 8,000 professionals, men and women, in supply chains in eight different countries. And we presented the findings, uh, that's Paul at, at Davos, um, on a panel with Sheryl Sandberg and with a number of other interesting people that talked about these issues. But we started to see this emergence of gender inequality, and this was a full eight months before Me Too. What I, the reason I point out Paul is he's not alone. You know, Google's doing amazing things. Facebook, a whole bunch of different companies are out here into this fray, and I think it really represents an interesting new micro trend that we should really focus on. We call it big ideals, and the idea is that really corporations are sort of emerging as this new moral authority. Let's call them sort of equal parts capitalists and activists, but what they're doing is capturing the imagination of investors and the buying public, and they're attracting talent, especially millennial and Gen Z talent, as they talk about their values and they live them in the marketplace. First thing I want to say is this is not your old-fashioned um, Oldsmobile CSR program. This is actually a big shift around programs that you can actually do to step in to really define and create what a truly public company means today. So this new generation of sort of Carnegies and Rockefellers we think are doing some really interesting things in society. So we're going to talk real briefly about why um, and what we're starting to see, and the reason why I think this, this environment has opened up is that we're seeing around the world some pretty interesting statistics around the lack of empathy and leadership. Uh, for my last book, The Athena Doctrine, we noted in, in a 13-country study that 76% of people, this is 64,000 people, disagreed with the concept that my country's leaders care more about me than they used to. 88% um, felt that there was a leadership crisis in their country and at large. And then 80% of people thought it would be more important if businesses got involved to fill this gap. Um, what we did is we did a piece of research and we modeled the data. We actually asked 64,000 people to um, gender 250 different human traits. We asked them to talk about them, whether they saw them as more likely to be more masculine or more feminine. That was half the sample. The other half of the sample, there was no talk about gender whatsoever. We actually asked, what are the qualities of an ideal 21st century modern leader? And what we started to see as we modeled the data is that sort of this pale, stale male uh, thing emerged on one hand, which was seen as more masculine, the old command and control, aggressive, proud, independent, versus an expressive, empathic, collaborative, more flexible, more agile leader that people preferred today. And in this context, we talked about it as sort of soft power, we started to see that there was a big impact on business. Because on one hand, people want businesses to get more involved. At the same time, they really uh, lack the credibility. And in fact, in our most recent reputation quotient poll data from Harris Poll, we actually see that today's reputation of a CEO is sort of seen in, in not a very positive light. They actually think that CEOs are not doing enough for society, and therefore they lack integrity. So what I'm going to try to do is show you some examples and frame that why we think this is a big opportunity to sort of tackle this challenge. Because um, Google's CEO, really interesting, Sundar, he, he framed this. He said, you know what? In the old days, in the, in the 60s and 70s, how big you were, that was your scale. That was also your reputation. But guys, today, scale is fail. And in fact, when we see in our Harris Poll data, the bigger you are, the more suspect you are. Right? So you were seen as less nimble, less agile, less able to innovate, and less able to relate on a more personal level. So how do you take that company and, and make it more micro, as Mark talked about? How do you make it more relatable to ordinary people, especially to Gen Z? Right? We have watched this z eruption emerge uh, in a really incredible way over the last two weeks, given the events, uh, the tragic events in Florida. And you start to see things, interesting things happening, right? We've got six teenagers that are running for governor in Kansas. 
You've got teams that are taking on um, Facebook to try to clean up these problems. The big interesting difference in this generation, and by the way, Generation Z were our interns, first wave of interns this past summer. They're stepping in being fully, fully digitally capable. This isn't about any sort of digital adaptation. This is like, we're talking coding, right? So we're thinking about inventing, we're thinking about creating, and critically, guys, we're thinking about action, right? Action is really the, the driving word. In that context of action, how do current you know, 20th century mentalities adapt to these new values? So some interesting things are happening, right? They're expecting institutions to do this. Goucher College, for example, has basically moved to video applications over essays and transcripts, right? At the same time, Lord, right? Lord, the, the pop star, she's, I have a 15-year-old daughter. She loves Lord. She put up on Twitter, she said, yeah, I find this curious. Two photos from today, one edited so my skin is perfect and one real. Remember, flaws are okay with 76,000 retweets, right? The important part about this generation is if they don't see transparency in action, they're gonna hijack it, right? That's what's gonna happen. So how do companies open themselves up? How do we become more porous to society, especially to these groups, to reach out and understand them? The problem is, you know, it's a very different world now with Google and Facebook and YouTube and, and Snapchat and WeChat and all these other platforms, but we still are thinking in a broadcasting mentality, right? That's not the reality when we think of traditional corporations and corporate reputation. So old corporate reputation used to be about window dressing, right? It was about sort of projecting an image on Meet the Press, Archer Daniels Midland, Supermarket to the World, all kinds of really great, you know, very important advertising campaigns, but they talked. They weren't really listening and engaging, and that's the big shift that's happening. The other thing that's happening is that CSR, the old idea around corporate reputation, actually was about sacrifice, right? Corporate reputation basically was talking about getting something in return for doing something less. It was about deprivation. And they don't see it this way. They don't see any difference between doing good and getting a really great sexy brand, right? Responsibility is the new sexy. So why are you asking the consumer marketplace to trade this off? So show us your values. It's your value and your values to really drive this forward. And I think the other really interesting thing about their mindset, and we'll see what happens as, as time moves on, but at this very moment, you could credibly say that they view themselves as elites and that everyone is an elite today. And I think that when we think about corporate reputation, we really narrow cast that definition down to more of, of a 1% style of targeting when in fact, we've gotta be thinking carefully through the public because today, 83% of consumers don't believe governments can solve issues alone. They want more people involved and more businesses. Um, that's also important because shareholders are listening, right? They're listening to the public, whether it's Exxon, whether it's Apple and iPhones and, and the questions around children and, and spending too much time on their smartphones. All these things are working their way through the chain of influence as we start to think about how companies need to act in today's world. So to kind of tidy this up, I mean, the, the big shift we see off of three pieces of data is that we're seeing trust declining with companies and brands by 50% since the global financial crisis. Millennials, 50%, they trust um, user-generated content by their peers more than traditional broadcast media. And then in meaning, in our data, 72% of millennials would work for less company at a culture whose values they admire. So with that, you really can't influence or spin the story. You can't persuade just with your money and scale, and you really can't fake your values. So what we're seeing is this interesting new emergence of, of what big ideals are all about. And there's really kind of two sides to this. What we're seeing is sort of a, a group of companies that are stepping in and doing what we call moonshots, which are sort of these big, mighty missions that are all about commercializing a vision of the future, a horizon, horizon of some incredible advancement and a better future for all of us. That's one side of it. The other side of it is they're holding up mirrors. They're actually self-regulating. They're creating their own standards and they're taking their own cultures and values and beliefs and applying them to their industries. In each case, both of them are sort of really stepping in to do good old fashioned public works, right? They're doing what either the government can't or won't do and they're stepping into the fray. So let's start first with sort of the moonshots. Um, you can't talk about moonshots without Elon Musk. 
The concept around moonshots, again, are this idea of showing us this incredible expanse of horizon of a future. You know, today people are selling their Tesla Model 3 reservations for a 300% profit. What's at the core of this idea is really what's called option value, right? If you buy into the belief of a company's more expansive future, you think it's worth more today because you think it's gonna be worth more in the future. So this discounted earnings sort of philosophy gets applied into branding because if you're showing a mission and a vision that you're gonna make life better for all of us, that's a company I wanna buy into. And we see that in our data, guys. We see 55% will buy more from brands who are vocal and visionary. 44% will buy from companies who are innovative. And then almost 40% of people say today they would actually believe that brands are better quality if they come from visionary CEOs and leaders. So this visionary game becomes really important and that's why these moonshots are so critical. And you see them everywhere, right? Um, MIT is doing some really interesting work on a $5 billion mission to solve the world's biggest challenges. It's called the MIT Campaign for a Better World. Volvo, they have come out with uh, interesting new focus on going all electric starting in 2019 as they phase out conventional engines. This is something that GM is doing. Most of the categories are doing is they focus on, on interesting work around autonomous driving, but that's really driving their stock price and their esteem. SpaceX, right? You got this exciting little astronaut guy that's sort of circling uh, the, the Earth in orbit in a Tesla Roadster. What was so interesting about that is they've set up, you know, this where is roadster.com so you can track it just like any other uh, ordinary satellite if you want to. And then you've got Microsoft that's pushing for a $10 billion effort to bring broadband into rural America. My point about these moonshots, guys, is that basically what companies are doing is they're taking a sliver of a public problem and they're going after it, right? Starbucks and minimum wage. Google is with Project Loon is delivering Wi-Fi using balloons into areas that, that can't be reached. It's finding some social problem, stepping out and promising that you're gonna make life a little bit better. Obviously Elon Musk, what he did with solar power in Puerto Rico, he actually had an interesting engagement with the Puerto Rican mayor saying that he could use his technology to get the grid back up. And on a Saturday morning through Twitter, the two said, let's talk. Right, so how, how you think about these things are so interesting. Amazon, Amazon is stepping into healthcare with Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan. At the bottom of the screen, I wanted to just reveal the new reputation quotient data that we'll be sending out next week. But when you see this, Tesla is number three, uh, the most re reputable company in modern reputation in our data. Amazon's number one, and Berkshire Hathaway's number 24 because people see these companies as having these really expansive, exciting horizons. I think the other thing they're doing is they're stepping in, again, where the government isn't. So Y Combinator, I mean, they're basically interesting, taking 3,000 people from Oakland and going back onto a, an old traditional focus around universal basic income. This is an experiment for five years to see if this will benefit uh, people in Oakland using um, artificial intelligence. AT&T, they've got smart sensors that are set up into public cities to actually identify crumbling infrastructure. Again, public works projects using their technology, using their IP to try to make life just a little bit better. Boeing, interesting, you know, Boeing's looking to transportation that could be commercialist in the sense of, of not having pilots that could create more efficient roads, routes and more efficient flying. And then Nestle, God love them, they found a way to cut sugar and chocolate by 40%. So all these little slivers of things that could be just a little bit better for us are really sort of the province of this, this idea around sort of moonshots. The second part of it though, is this idea of mirrors. So mirrors are basically taking your own company's culture and your own moral authority and applying it to your competition and to your industry. We see this with Walmart. Walmart's focused on sustainable sourcing. Right, this is taking your leverage, taking your scale, taking your IP and putting it back into the supply chains or your ecosystems. And the reason that's important is that 44% of people in our data said they will buy from companies who are socially responsible. 39% said that they would switch brands they routinely use who aren't treating their employees well. And then 36 have shunned a brand in the past year due to their actions in response to current events. So with this sort of concept of mirror, 
is really taking your scale and your influence, but merging that with your values to really set some new standards. And what we find fascinating about it is there is this self-regulation that's starting to emerge as the private sector sets forth ways to sort of partner and create new ideas. We saw this most famously a couple weeks ago with BlackRock, right? That said, what are you doing to be worthy of our investment? Unilever CMO has stepped in to challenge um, toxic content using their advertising as potential. Um, Disney, interestingly, taking 125,000 employees, giving them a thousand bonuses, thousand dollar bonuses to create this $50 million tuition fund. And then HEB, which is actually number six in our reputation quotient data, uh, with Publix, they traded resources back and forth to support each other during the hurricanes that affect each of their regions uh, where their grocery stores operate. So with this sort of we economy, you also see companies stepping up into their footprint and doing things that are based on their values. Kroger, you know, in the Midwest has been decimated by the opioid epidemic. Um, the Kroger CEO offered anti-overdose drug without prescription. And then Royal Bonaire Airlines really helped influence the, the policies in Saudi Arabia about women driving. What they decided to do with their first tactic and stunt was land an all-female uh, pilot crew into Saudi Arabia at the time when women weren't allowed to drive. We'll show them. Let's just fly in. Um, Interestingly, with Patagonia, right? So Patagonia is really focusing on, on public works on a number of fronts. They're into public parks. Uh, they focused, obviously, on the recyclable addition. They focused on taking the um, Black Friday sales and donating that to different NGOs. This is one of my favorite. They took their patents, right, on an all-natural wetsuit, and they basically opened that up to their competitors because they figured that would really drive their values. Google, you know, interesting, is taking a 15 free, uh, free 15 hour machine learning crash course as part of an AI resource center. Pixar is teaching storytelling if you want to learn it, right? It's how do you take company, how do you create experiences through your education? How do you find ways to share your IP that's really going to work for the public good? Airbnb, for example, is committing to housing with 100,000 refugees with open home platforms in the next five years. And then there's Sephora. Sephora is really interesting to us because they're sort of embodying this new trend that if you're a big company, the way you can actually adapt and learn and keep pace today is by incubating small startups. Here in the case of what Sephora is doing is they're actually created Sephora Incubator, which is focused on taking the top 10 beauty startups that are all female-led businesses, incubating them with legal, with HR, getting them into the stores and helping them really grow and nurture their brands. And what they're finding, like General Mills is doing this with their 301 VC venture arm, is they're actually learning from their competition rather than, than crushing them. They're becoming more agile and more nimble and smaller by really embracing their values and helping the next generation of innovative companies to sort of come along. Um, loved this. I don't know if you guys saw this over the weekend, but Lacoste is replacing its logo to help save 10 endangered species. So gone is the crocodile, and it's replaced with all these uh, really important animals that need to be saved. And then Gucci has just announced um, that it's going fur-free forever in its spring 2018 collection. So again, you know, finding ways to take your value and your values and, and really put them in vogue. So, I'm going to go real quickly through this, um, but I wanted to just kind of give you an economic argument for why we should care about these moonshots and mirrors, these big ideals. We looked at our RQ Harris data, and we looked at all the different social ideas. And what you can see in the, um, in the peach is the level of which they see companies having impact uh, on these social issues, like access to health care or supporting veterans. And the green is the importance of the social issue to them. A real simple way of saying is that you get a lot of credit if you get involved in these issues, but they don't think businesses are doing enough. So how do businesses step in, whether it's in healthcare, supporting veterans, job creation, sexual harassment, racial equality, education? These are the things that are on people's minds today. They see corporations having these resources. They have private sector innovation and creativity. How do you carve off a sliver and really find a way to take your public goods and, and make a big difference. And the reason why we think it's important is that we actually see it driving new value today. So we've got two measures that we've been measuring brands. And this is a um, 
and reputation. The, the one on the north axis is this metric we call irreplaceability. This is, would people really care if your company or your brand went away tomorrow? The other side is momentum. This is really a proxy for sort of your vision and whether people see you have an expansive idea on the future. So what you see in the um, bottom left are sort of companies that aren't really seen as strong on either, or they've suffered some sort of scandal, or they've lost their way through their technology. The blue chips are interesting to us because that's the frame of reference today. These are companies that we go, wow, they've got great equities, they've been around a long time, but I don't really know if they're doing a lot that's really innovative. I'll give you an example, Krispy Kreme, right? Is it irreplaceable? Can you replace Krispy Kreme? Probably not. When's the last time you had a Krispy Kreme? Right, so it doesn't have the momentum or, or the vision. But the other side of it are the insurgents in the bottom right. The insurgents are actually creating all this vision and momentum. They're actually disrupting the blue chips. They're creating sort of this force of reconsideration. But the interesting companies to us that are really thriving, that are seen both as irreplaceable, having this, this sense of values, and having this sense of vision, are these companies that are around big ideals. And we see Tom's up there, Tesla, Google's up there, Patagonia, Apple, Adidas, Amazon, Lego, companies that are deploying their creativity, but are also have a sense of a social mission. Microsoft, you know, companies that are stepping up to do things to try to make a difference. We then lastly uh, fielded a really interesting piece of quantitative research with um, 200 corporate affairs executives in Fortune 1000 firms. These are C-suites, these are corporate affairs officers. They're responsible for either sustainability, corporate comms, investor relations, marketing communications. And basically, they're stuck in a paradox today because they see this big ideals movement happening and at the same time they're restricted to some extent. So 89% of them in our quant survey said that it's important to express your company's vision out into the public, but nearly equal in mouse, almost 80% said they're restricted in speaking out on societal issues. And then we asked why, and they said, well, only 20% of us actually have a policy in place for doing so. What the old model really has been about is corporate reputation is avoid societal issues at all costs, stay more private and focused, speak out as you need to on an ad hoc basis, which is fine. That's the, the culture and character of any individual company. But what we're seeing happening now is this disruption in society that is forcing companies to become more porous, to become more open and more responsive. But this really got us uh, interesting. Uh, this to us was fascinating because we asked these very same corporate affairs executives around this concept of how do you react to a, a social issue. And 18% said there's a risk of taking a stance because we might get it wrong and we might have to apologize. But nearly three times as many said we are really concerned about being perceived as indifferent to the struggles within society, right? So this optics of indifference to us was a really interesting sort of paradox that corporate affairs executives find themselves in, which is how do you be agile and nimble? How do you not make a mistake? But at the same time, how do you not appear tone deaf to what's going on in society? And the reason why this is so important is that the consumer marketplace in our data is actually now starting to make buying decisions based on corporate reputation, right? Through them, especially Gen Z millennials, corporate reputation isn't just a, a, a corporate affairs exercise anymore, it's actually a marketing branding affair, right? People buy into brands from companies they admire. So our argument really is, is that corporate affairs, corporate communications, marketing and branding are all sort of merging together. And how do you start to align your brand with your vision, with all the different assets that you have inside your company? Because you've got to have integrity. Uh, the Pope said this this week, and he said it's better to be an atheist than a hypocritical Catholic who leads a double life. That's coming from the Vatican, <laughs> right? And we saw Del Delta saying that their values are not for sale. So. We, this is an emerging um, concept, it's an emerging time, it's fascinating to us. What we think is interesting about this is that clearly the old adage, you don't just necessarily want to step into politics. Well, today's world, this idea of companies that are actually rising above politics by serving society. And so we start to believe that really the social sciences are kind of the next forefront for reputation and innovation.
right? How do companies think about their role within society and how do they leverage that in a way that's gonna be really unique and creative? So that's sort of a real brief summary of some of the research we've been working on, but we, we think that there's an interesting idea around businesses filling in to this void of leadership, this void of sort of dysfunction today. And I think what I really took away from the data and sort of this quick summary is that, you know, with corporate reputation today, it's not about what you say, it's about what you do. And it, what you do is actually the things that are starting to create traction and excitement in society. So they're going at it proudly. They're not hiding from it. They're saying, actually, our prosperity is tied to thinking more about society. We're thinking about being capitalists and activists. We're getting above the politics. And we're going to go after and try to do things that government can or won't. So I, what I would take away as you think about this, you know, from your brands and your company is how do you treat society as the marketplace? How do you think about consumers like investors? Because today's world is not corporate versus brand. It's actually how do you market your, your values to all these different audiences? And that's it. We do a lot of this type of work with some really great clients. We're really proud to work with IBM and Ford. We just launched uh, the new survey at Davos with GLAAD that looked at um, the acceptance of the LGBTQ community uh, in America. And it's the type of you know, data and thought leadership that we really love to do. So that's a quick overview of some stuff we're thinking about. And thank you guys for your time.